The year is 1995 and the Mod Squad rules. It was kind of like a designer's dream come true. I don't think of myself as kind of a classic beauty. It's about being yourself and who that is and what you want to contribute today. There was some sort of a revolution that happened. It was very, very exciting. It was a Mod Mod year, so stay tuned. For fall 1995, designers put a modern spin on the Mod Mod. Mod emerged from London in the early 60s, as the staid style of the establishment was shattered by a pop culture revolution. From the Beatles and the Rolling Stones to Marianne Faithful and Twiggy, a new generation was taking over style. The trendsetters were known as modernists, and they bought their mod threads on London's parks. London is all shook up by a rock and roll fashion show of the latest Carnaby Street gear. The clothes are with it, and the buyers don't want to be left without it. New items include fur coats for fellas and peekaboo blinders for the girls. The big beat sets the mood for these mad mods. Mary Quant was the designer who set the beat on Carnaby Street. After revolutionary stylist Videl Sassoon gave her a geometric haircut, she became her own best model. Well, we started the shop in, in Chelsea, uh, very much for our friends. Um, I think we were the most surprised that people came so quickly from all over the world to buy from this very small shop. Mm -hmm. um, we were designing for people that uh, were often painters or actors or uh, singers and, and who were feeling for something very new in fashion. And somehow this anticipated a look that became absolutely uh, international and universal. Um, and I think it has a straight route right through to today. It was a very natural involvement for me because of my past. In the 60s, I worked with Mary Quant, and we, I guess, through this whole thing that happened in London then, what we called the meritocracy, there was some sort of a revolution that happened. It was very, very exciting. And we found that the fashion press from all over the world started to come to London. When fashion photographer David Bailey started to chronicle the swinging London scene, mods spread worldwide. Bailey and his muse model Jean Shrimpton became fashion's first celebrities. Girls all over the world wanted to look like the shrimp, and the supermodel was born. By 1995, supermodel status was stronger than ever. The modeling industry had become big business, and its stars were already household names. 90s pop culture has its reference in the 60s, and nothing reflects that better than the world of fashion. Just as the mod men of the 60s had their leaders, the faces of each look, so did the new mod squad of 1995. Linda Evangelista's new geometric bob ushered in the mod nameless sweep in the season. In a nod to these mod men, 90s mod brought the return of fussy suits and saddle roll like tails. Styles which evoked the spirit of the 60s had a definite 90s edge. As the poet said, boots, 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 they're in calf-hugging styles and in every imaginable fall color. And perhaps due to Nancy Sinatra's 1995 comeback, designers were gaga for go-go. Tension was drawn away from the knee of the season before and towards the cap, as the shoe of the fall 1995 season was the go-go boot. Nostalgia, it was more like an acknowledgement of the similarities of style. The Chelsea girls were all about pulled together chic with simple lines and shapes. 
much like the direction fashion was moving into since the start of the 90s. The advanced technology of the 90s made for new fabrics unheard of in the 60s. The comfort and movement of clothes in 1995 was unrivaled. Retro chic for the 1995 Mod Squad. No other designer epitomized the new mod like Anna Sui, who made her name in New York with her trendy downtown designs. Always on the pulse of 90s street style, Sui won fans with a hip and trendy set, making her a favorite of her model friends. In 1995, Sui's career path took her to Milan where a new venture for the Italian company Iceberg brought out more of Sui's model fans. We know Anna since 1993 and we called Anna to work for us for a 100% line, which is a Iceberg second line. We love working with Anna. She has a great uh, capability to, uh, to understand the different needs of the markets in Europe and the world and uh, we thought what, what uh, was a great idea to, to make a second line, Anna Sui, so Sui by Anna Sui. Since the first line, Anna Sui, is not uh, sold, uh, sold in, uh, in Europe. I've been consulting for the Cento Pacento collection for the last year, and um, the working relationship has been great. Uh, they're a fantastic company, and when Paolo asked me if I wanted to do a collection, it was kind of like a designer's dream come true. So it's, it's been great working together. I think it's fantastic. I've never seen any of it before, so I'm really shocked. It's something she just did on her little own and didn't say anything about it. No, it's, I want a lot of things. <laughs> she's, she's telling him now. <laughs> the leopard skin <laughs> I think they're genius. This dress is like Anna Sui herself. <laughs> it's very sweet, it's very nice, it's very comfortable. It's. Uh, it's beautiful and feels good. I like it. I like it. Yeah. They're very cute. I really like them. I think that I've always shown my clothes, if you've seen my store in New York, if you've seen my new showroom in New York, and my house even is like this. So, you know, it had to be. And uh, what was pretty exciting was that all this furniture was available here. So we, we got it together very quickly. Anna Sui for 1995. Who was the British model that was 1995's new star? Stella Tennant, whose edgy attitude captured the essence of the new mod. How would you describe your look? If someone were to ask you. Well, it's a, I don't know, I guess a little bit offbeat. I don't think of myself as kind of a classic beauty, like, well, I don't know, like Karen Mulder or something. I mean, I'm not, it's not what I look like at all. It's kind of the opposite end. <laughs> If you could just tell us a little bit about how you got started in modeling. Okay. Well, the, the, I was at art college before, finished art college, was taking a bit of a summer break, you know, after my degree show and everything. And a friend of a friend was working at British Vogue, and they were looking for people for, for a shoot with Stephen Mizell, who was coming over. He didn't want to work with, with people who were, like, not, I mean, models. He wanted to work with normal people, so. I'm not really a normal person anymore, but I was then. But I just thought, well, you know, I don't know what is, you know, what is the possibility of it. I don't know what could happen, but I might take it and see where it goes. And I did, and this is kind of where I ended up, you know. It's pretty weird, you get used to it very quickly though. And also you don't think that everybody sees those magazines, you know? You think that you're going to, you know, super snaps to pick up your photographs. 
You know what I mean? Because yeah. you were just there in a studio with a bunch of people doing a job, and it doesn't sink in that a lot of people see those images. What do you think about when you're walking down the runway? I just kind of just go into kind of focused out there somewhere. It's so manic because you're just running back here and you're changing and everything. You're just like, okay, just doing something calm, you know. These shows are pretty hectic. What's the worst thing that has happened, to, like for your first runway or? No, don't know. Just the constant like hair and makeup. You know, you go insane. <laughs> you no, know, you get up and you like we were supposed to be here at six this morning. And, and yesterday, I, they came to pick me up at 4.30 for a show, so you're like, I don't want to get my makeup done this morning. I astroplane. <laughs> I just leave my body and go, okay, do whatever you want to it. I don't want to be around while it's happening. Anything that is like open to doing you that you've never dreamed that you would ever do before? Like well, all of it, yeah. Definitely all of it. You know, I mean, I would never have travelled as much. I've met a lot of people who I like very much. Met some people who I don't like so much, <laughs> but that goes with everything. You know, every season it's easier because you get to know people better. Becoming a big star, you're the famous friend, huh? Oh, yes, sir. Huh? But she's deserving it. The classic Italian label Mosca created a new image of modernity in 1995. For fall, the company wanted to make a splash and a statement on the international fashion scene. Staging their show on Europe's Women's Day, Mosca saluted the magnificence of ladies the world over with a stellar lineup of accomplished women, most over the average model age. Working with famed photographer Michelle Comte, who was directing his very first fashion show, and model actress Dale Haddon, the face of Mosca, Mosca took the spotlight off the models and put it back on the real women. Younger girls looked at models as an, an example to follow. And, uh, they felt a little bit bad about it because they were thinking maybe when we are older we will not be so great and so beautiful and this could be a problem. So we thought if we take a person like Dale, she's in her 40s, she's beautiful, she can rassure all the younger people and uh, can teach to the, all the women of the world that we can be beautiful at 40. So we started with this concept. I think that they're representing all aspects of women. By taking personalities to do the show, I think they're saying that every woman is unique and every woman has her own story. And it's not so much an anonymous person carrying the clothes, it's somebody with a history, with a background, uh, coming out as a personality. So each person coming out will be different. Each person will bring their own story to e each outfit. So I think that's, it's about being unique. It's about being yourself and who that is and what you want to contribute today. A lot of the women that are here have worked with over the years with Italian Vogue, American Vogue, you know, all the different magazines, Vanity Fair. And I think some of them are very well known beauties and some of them are not so well known but a lot of fun and I think it's important that women like this are shown more and I think they're all pretty amazing especially in one room together. Oh, I think it's tremendous and uh, I understand that it's Women's Day in, in Milan or Italy and um, I think it's a great tribute to women. Um, a lot of wonderful actresses and singers and um, women that I always wanted to meet I like the idea of these different women. I think it's nice to have real women do this instead than just only models. I thought it was a good idea because um, women come in all shapes and sizes and ages, so it's good that they use real women. Well, I think it's really, really much more interesting to uh, 
to put clothes on people that have a life, a real life of interiority and not just models that are plain beautiful girls. Those clothes are for every woman. about it it's it's all kinds of women we're tall like me we're short we're fat we're skinny we're older we're younger we're actresses and models and designers and and everything and, and I think that's a very good cross-section representative of women what I liked about it was that it was sort of honoring women with personalities and uh, who you know of style and actresses for a change and uh, and I thought that was great so thought to be part of a, a great group of women, you know, was a, a nice thing to do. I mean, these women are all very beautiful, I see around. I mean, I would nearly consider them, you know, being models because they are very beautiful, except that they have something else in their mind, maybe then only their beauty. You will hear about us, you will listen about us in the future a lot, I think, for the fashion, but also for the concept behind the fashion. When I was small, they say you will do nothing in your life. You are too untidy. You are too <laughs> crazy. You are too lazy. <laughs> you are not going to do anything in your life. Determined to prove them all wrong, Agnes B has truly mastered the fashion cliche modern classics. By 1995, she had 73 shops that bore her name, bringing up a $247 million business. Maybe you come here and then it curves round. I really wanted to do simple clothes that were easy for people to wear and to keep for a long time. All this philosophy about clothes. I like clothes more than fashion, you know? Put back your coat, you're too cold, my darling. <laughs> Dancing in the street, mm -hmm. to the trees and come back. <laughs> it's nice with the sky there. Yeah, it's nice like that. After you help her down. I think it's nice, yeah. When I see a material, I know what it's going to be when it's done, you know. I know what it's going to look like. And this is very easy for me. It's, it's nice. There must be an ID. The material must be interesting and very central to touch. For me, it's very important. If the, if the material is not kind, you can't do anything nice with it. So I always touch the clothes and touch the material. Like that, it's like a play. It's like playing with my friends in the attic, you know, sometimes, <laughs> of my grandmother. Let's try that. always been a fan of art and music and cinema and all expressions and for me the, the gallery is really um, important. I have very eclectic tastes and I think this is nicer for people who come to the gallery often. They can see new things, different things, different expressions. I like simple, you know. There's just a touch of an idea, but it's enough for me. Clothes mustn't be problematic. I like mixing colors too. All the materials are very soft. I've always been making different lengths. I don't like too much fashionable clothes because after they, they come out, they are demodé very quickly.
I don't like exclusion, so I try to make clothes for different women, different ages, but it's a question of style, mostly. Uh, women who want to be feminine, but not sexy, pushing sexy part of themselves at the, at the front. I think it's, I like the minor style better than major, you know. I think uh, mind is more important than, than body, in a way. And I try to make mind come out, even if the body is there too. Sometimes I work with uh, petal from flowers or color of the sky or anything in inspires me. I imagine their way of living and I try to make my best for them to, be, to feel beautiful and comfortable and have confidence in their clothes. No problem clothes. Now people have to count and, you know, when they buy something they want to be able to wear it. So. I try to express what's, what interests me by fashion, by clothes uh, on the side. Many, many things interest me, in fact, even more than fashion, <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the hippest shoe of choice among fashion's free spirits in 1995? Freeness, you, you, you say that? Freelance shoes were everybody's favorite accessories that year. I like these boots because they are from, how I must say, contemporary. It's for me, boots will stay for years and years and years. It's a new classical, um, in French we say indemodable. What is very important is that fashion is always changing. One year you love uh, red leather and the other one you love uh, high heels and the other season you love to be very flat. So it's always changed. And freelance change always with the fashion. They're always in the fashion. That's very important. It's why people love freelance. L'objectif, c'est de détendre les chaussures, c'est de détendre les larges de l'âge de la personne. Et qu'on veut toujours les faire tout le monde dans les chaussures, chaussures une femme qui a 18 ans, une femme qui a 50 ans. What the success of freelance is that we make shoes very fashion, that's the first point. Second point, a quality, a good, very good quality, and the price. The Mod Squad of 1995, from Fashion Classics.